Um, the homework that you have just uh, acquired, that you will perhaps not be happy to have acquired, but nonetheless, um, they are proofs, of course. And we're going to do a lot of proofs uh, from here on out. There's, there's essentially two elements left of the course, uh, one of which is proofs. <laughs> and on your final, there will be four proofs, just as there are on this homework. So you better get good at proofs, because they're a big chunk of your final. Now, some people will love proofs. The lucky, the lucky few. Most people do not love proofs until they've got uh, a little bit of practice under their belts, until they have learned the rules. Oh, yes. Um, I have a question about homework nine. Homework nine. OK, what? Uh huh. It's A or B and A or C, and then delta. Wait a minute. So A or B and A or C and A or C. You mean draw a line underneath it? Okay, yeah. Uh, tell them, then pick uh, parentheses. Tell them A or B or tell them A or C. Yeah. Is that because of the De Morgan's or not because it's negative? It's De Morgan's law. Because remember, it works in both directions. Yeah. So in other words, if imagine you started with this and you did De Morgan's law, right? You would distribute the tilde, so you would have uh, a double tilde here and a double tilde here. You get rid of the parentheses and this would become an and, right? But of course, double tilde is equivalent to no tilde, and you have the original, okay? All right, uh, yes, so um, give me, Chaubel, a rule. First of all, give me um, a rule, one of the 19, and then you have to tell me what type of a rule it is. So, we'll start with, um, actually, there's some listed there. Okay. All right, so we have uh, inference forms, and then we have equivalence forms. You have a choice of 19. Equivalent. Okay, good. So, uh, Nick. Uh, addition. addition, and what kind is that? Uh, you have a 50 50 chance. Did you learn it first, or was it more recent? Toss a coin. <laughs> What's that? No, it's inference. Because you can't do it to parts of light. So for example, if I had A and B, I couldn't do A or uh, C and B. I can't do that. I would have to add it to the whole line. So the resulting line would have to be a disjunction. Zach? Implication. My favorite. Biconditional. Biconditional. Where's that? Equivalent. Equivalent. Nobody should be cheating by looking. You've got to rely on what knowledge you have already. Destiny. And what's that? All right. Obviously, the equivalents are fresh in your mind. Samantha. Yes. Hypothetical syllogism. Inference. Eric, give me a rule. Very good. What is that inference or equivalence? equivalence? No, it has to be inference. All the syllogisms have to be inference. Say that. Exportation. Exportation. That's probably my second favorite. I like that one. For 
Wendy. Um, uh, yes, what's that? <laughs> Contraposition. Contra. Not just the name of a famous video game. Yes. Constructive dilemma. Constructive dilemma. Yes. Uh, Destructive dilemma. Destructive dilemma. Yeah, that, that was a good one, wasn't it? Simplification. Inference. Yep. Distribution equivalence. Distribution equivalence. We're doing pretty well. Don't let us down, Josh. Uh -huh. Don't let us down. How many have we got left? One, two, three, four, five, six. Uh, so six. Association. Association, which is? Uh, inference? No. Equivalence. OK. Cat. Which is? Inference. Inference. Good. Back to you, Shavel. You had it easy before. Uh, but you got it easy now if you look at this one. Uh, modest tolerance. Very good. Nick. Well, you don't have to read it. You just have to reel off some ones, and I'll tell you if you've already got them. Uh, simplification. Simplification? Yeah, we've got that one. That's what that says. Um, See, that one, come on, you can read that. My hand, I know my handwriting is Oh, yeah, I forgot my glasses. Oh, okay. I see. <laughs> Anyone? Conjunction, Conjunction or, which is what? Inference. Inference, double negation, which is? And there's one more. Commutation. Commutation, yes. Good. Make sure you memorize those. And you memorize, of course, it's easy knowing the names. Well, not that easy, but it's harder to put them into practice. But the faster you do memorize them, the easier and more enjoyable proofs will become. No, that they could really be much more enjoyable. All right, let's practice. Can you shut the door? Yeah. Um, okay, where are someone's practice? Let's turn to page, um, yeah, page 388. Um, let's do number 10, just for the sheer joy of it. Page 388, question 10. Uh, we have I or J, if I or J, then K. Premise. L, if L or M, then not K. Something odd going on there. M, and those are the premises, and then the conclusion is not J. this one with you. Now, um, <coughs> where, okay. all right, so remember there are two approaches that I've said to doing proofs. There's what I've called the top down and there's what I've called the bottom up. With the bottom up, you would ignore the conclusion and just see what you can do. Now, in this case, there's not something you can immediately do. However, there's something that you can sort of set up fairly quickly. 
So for example, you got this M here. You can't do modus ponens or modus tollens or disjunctive syllogism or anything with that because it's not by itself. But where does it show up elsewhere in the premises? Line two. Line two. It shows up as part of the antecedent of a conditional. Now, if you had the antecedent of that conditional, you could do what? Modus ponens. Is there a way that you can get that fairly easily? Yes, you can do addition. So let's do that. And, and I'm going to take probably one extra step than you would, which is because I'm, I'm going to add L on, on the right, just because that's the normal way we do addition. And then I'm going to do commutation to change the order around. And then what am I going to do next? Modus ponens. Modus ponens, what two lines? Somebody who hasn't said anything? What was that? Lines. Line two and five. And what's that going to give me? Not K. Not K. Okay, we're still just messing around. We haven't really looked at the conclusion yet. Now that I've got not K, is there something I can do with that not K? Well, look where K shows up elsewhere. So obviously, don't look at line two because that's where we got it from. But is there another line where K shows up? Line one. Can we use not K with line one? You could do contraposition and then modus ponens, or you could just do modus tollens. Each of those are equally right, but one is just quicker. So if we do modus tollens, now, one advantage to doing that contraposition and then modus ponens is if you find yourself making mistakes with modus tollens, and, and some people forget to add the tilde in modus tollens. So if I do modus tollens, what two lines? One, two. one and six. What will that give me? It'll give me whatever the antecedent is with a tilde in front of it. So not I or J. Okay. Let's pause at this moment and, uh, and now we've just been messing around. Up to this point we've just been messing around to see what we could do. Now I'm going to remind myself what the conclusion is. Oh, it's not J. Can I get not J out of this? I can do it in two steps. Distribution. Not distribution. See, I do understand that. That's it is the thing that distributes the tilde, but it's not distribution. It's De Morgan's law. So if I do De Morgan's law, somebody who hasn't said anything yet, what will that give me? De Morgan's law to 97 gives me what? Was he right? Not I and. Not I and. And that's a crucial point because of what you're going to do next. What are you going to do next, everybody? Simplification. Simplification. Of which side? Stupid question. Not J. And what do you do next? Stop. Nothing, because you're done. That's the conclusion. All right, so that was a fairly straightforward proof. Why don't you try number 11? He might as well stop. Um, the other possibility, of course, is you could get a conditional and convert it into a disjunction by implication. Or finally, what two um, inference rules have as their conclusion a disjunction? The dilemmas. Constructive and destructive. And you might think to yourself, why might those occur to you? Because of line two. If you look, line two, you have a conjunction of two conditionals, and the consequence of each of those uh, conditionals are the consequence of this. So this looks like uh, this would be one of the premises, and this would be the conclusion of constructive dilemma. So in order to do that, you need to get the other premise. 
What is the other premise that you would need here to get this conclusion? D or F? Aha! Well, here's D and here's F. Now, you might think, well, maybe I can simplify that, but no, you can't, because this is a disjunction. So, what to do? Any suggestions? <laughs> None at all? Can't you simplify one? Nope, you can't simplify number one. Although you have a conjunction here, it's trapped in parentheses. You can only simplify it when the entire line is a conjunction. What you can do, suppose you have something that looks like this. Um, suppose you have something that looks like this. Circle or parentheses, triangle and square. What rules should occur to you? Distribution. Distribution. What would that give you if you did distribution to that? Circle or triangle, yes. And circle or square. Well, why am I bringing this up? Answer, because you have got something like that. If you treat this as a single unit. If you treat this a bit like circle. So if I treat that as a single unit, I will have uh, D and E or F. Keep going. And D and E or G. Now, the advantage, this was by distribution to line 1. The advantage of this is what it is. It's a conjunction. What can you do with conjunctions? <coughs> Simplify them. Which side do I want? Do I want the left side or the right side? The left side. Why do I want the left side? Because what we're trying to get is D or F. And this has D and it has F in it. This doesn't have F in it. So I want this side. And it will give me D and E or F. But it's still not exactly what we want because of that pesky E. What to do now? What's that? Do it again. Sure, why not? So if I do distribution again to line 4, what will it be? I'm going to do it in a slightly unusual order this time, but you should be able to handle it. What will that give me if I do distribution to line 4? Uh, D what? D D or F and E or F. Does everyone see that? Remember, you treat it like as if it was like two plus three A. That would give you two A plus three A. That's a bit what, so if you've got, instead of the two, you have D, and instead of the multiply, you have or. All right, now what? How many stages are we from the finish line? How many more lines does this proof need? Three. I think just two. What's the, uh, what's the next line? Simplification, line five. What side do I want? I want D or F. Why do I want D or F? So I can do constructive dilemma, what two lines? Two and six. So we have if D then H and if uh, F then I. D or F will give us H or I. Which is the conclusion. So basically, the way that worked is we worked out, we saw this, 
we saw that these were the consequences of them, and we thought, we thought to ourselves, because we'd learned all our rules so thoroughly, what jumped out at us was constructive dilemma. And then we said, well, to do constructive dilemma, I need D or F. And then all of the rest of this was just about getting D or F, because we knew we needed D or F to get constructive dilemma. All right. As I said, if that was a little scary to you, um, I'm sorry. <laughs> that one was a fairly tricky one. Uh, but practice makes perfect. All right, now, before you do some more proofs, I'm going to introduce a technique that will help. So this is one of those instances where learning more makes things easier. Okay, I know this might seem counterintuitive because you're being forced to work, but it's true. If you learn this method, conditional proof, that I'm about to teach you, it will make doing uh, a fairly large number of proofs a lot easier. Okay, how does conditional work proof work? Well, I'm going to use the example from the book because I'm lazy and unimaginative. So here's the argument. Premise 1, if A, then if B, then C. Premise 2, B, conclusion, if A, then C. Now, there is a way to do this without using conditional proof. But it's a lot trickier than the way that does use conditional proof. So I'm going to use conditional proof first. All right. Now, the normal way when we see something like this, when we see a proof that we have to do, I say, look around and see if there's anything you can do. Can you do modus ponens? Can you do, if there are any um, syllogisms you can do. Can you do disjunctive syllogism? Can you do hypothetical syllogism? Can you do modus ponens? Those are the things you check for. Because syllogisms combine the information of two lines, which you're going to have to do at some point. All right, well, we look at this and we think, well, if we had A, we could do modus ponens, right? Because A is the antecedent there. And wouldn't that be nice if we could, wouldn't that be nice if we had A? We could do modus ponens. Let's be good to ourselves. Let's give ourselves A. Huh? You say? I didn't know that was an option. Can I just make stuff up? Uh, where, now, of course, if we're going to be good to ourselves, we still have to say where we got A. We have to write on the line where A comes from. And the answer is, I pulled it out of my... No, that's short for assumption. That's short for assumption. I assume. I assume, and this is one of the rare occasions where assuming does not make an ass out of you or me. We're allowed to do it. Now, why are we allowed to do it? You might think, well, if we're allowed to do that, why don't we just assume the conclusion and then we're done? Well, the answer to that is uh, given by something weird about that line. What is weird about the line as I've written it? It's offset. It's indented. And that's important. It is indented to indicate something. It's indented to indicate that we're in fantasy land. We have left the real world behind. Why have we left the real world behind? Because we're making shit up, right? We didn't have A, we just assumed it. So you can't just write A on the real world because you haven't earned it. The only way you can write something in the real world is if you've proved it or if you're given it as premises. We haven't. We've just made it up. We've just said, we want it, so we're going to assume it. You're allowed to do that so long as you admit that this isn't the real world. You're just making stuff up. Okay, we're in fantasy land. It's a happy place. Let's see what we can do with our assumption. Why did we want A in the first place? Why did we assume A? So we could do modus ponens. And that will give us if B then C by modus ponens 1 comma, three. Now, now we've got if B then C, what else can we do? C. We can get C. Somebody else, how did we get C? What's that? What, what did we use? What rule did we use? Modus ponens, uh, lines four, comma, two. So we're just kind of messing around here, except we're done. The proof is done. 
Wait, what, you say? Yes. What, how, how the hell did that work? Well, the answer is, what we have just done, and notice I wrote that back in the real world. If I wrote this indented, it wouldn't count. It would just be made up. But we're back in the real world, and we have proved if A, then C. How have we proved it? By something called <coughs> conditional proof, CP for conditional proof, all the indented lines. So three, not three comma five, but three through five. It includes all the indented lines. How does that work? It looks like a cheat. Why do these indented lines, which after all started with me assuming something, just anything I wanted, <coughs> how does that prove if A then C? What's the answer? Because you're assuming A is true. So? And then you're steps. proving that C is true if A is true. Exactly. In other words, have we, have we proved that A is true? No. This line is an assumption. We're saying what if. So we say, if A is true, let's see what follows logically. Well, this follows logically. So essentially, we said, if A is true, then C is true. And that's what this says. It says, if A, then C. So the way conditional proof works is you assume, if you want to prove a conditional, that's, that's why it's called conditional proof. It only works if you want to prove a conditional. Well, we do want to prove a conditional, because our conclusion is a conditional. How do you do it? You assume the antecedent. You say, let's see what happens if A is true, and then what do you try and get on your last indented line? You assume the antecedent on your first indented line, and what's on your last indented line? The consequent. And you've shown that if A was true, then C is true. Now, uh, fantasy land, yeah, there are rules. There are certain things that you can and can't do. It's like feeding the gremlins after midnight. And we'll get into those in a second. But, um, try a couple of proofs using this method. So turn to page 391 and try practice quiz 13.8. <coughs> so remember, what you do <coughs> is you Oh, here's something that is always true. If there's stuff that you can do without assuming, if there's stuff that is immediately obvious that is going to be useful that you can do without assuming, then do it before you assume. You don't have to assume as the first line after your premises. You can wait for a bit before you take the leap into fantasy land. Maybe you won't need to do it at all. Maybe you can do the proof without assuming at all. And actually, let me just... Um, demonstrate that you can do this proof without assuming at all. Um, there we go. Um, does anyone know how you could do this without assuming? It's actually similar to a trick I showed you when we were doing commutation and association. Implication. Well, we don't have to do implication. Well, except you can't do commutation to this. What you do is exportation to line one, which gives you what? A and B, then C. Then you do commutation, which will give you what? B and A, because of course you can only do commutation to a conjunction or a disjunction, you can't do it to the conditional. Then what do I do? Association. Not association, you can't do association with a conditional. What do you do? Exportation. Exportation again. Exportation line four, which gives you? If B, then if A, then C, and then your last line, which of course will be the conclusion, is what? Modus ponens, 5, comma, 2. Yeah, see? So you can prove it without assuming, but it's a bit more tricky, right? That one is a lot harder than just assumption in a couple of modus ponens. It's, 
So usually you can do proofs without assuming, but it's often harder. So it's good to know conditional proof because it will make proofs easier. All right, with that in mind, um, try practice quiz 13.8. It died? Uh, no, I was fixing it. What's that? If L, then M, and if M, then L. Now, we've assumed K. What are we trying to get on our last line? Last indented line, that is. Not M. Not M, because that's the, we assume the antecedent, we try and get the consequence. So we're trying to get not M. Which side of this conjunction, which I can simplify, do I want if I'm going to get not M? Do I want the left side or do I want the right side? The right side. The right side. Why do I want the right side? Because what am I going to do next? Modus tollens. What's that? <laughs> Modus tollens. Modus tollens, what two lines? Six and two. So if, if M then L, denying the consequent, not L, that's going to give me not M. Now what? How many more lines does my proof need? Two. Two. What's number eight? First of all, where is number eight? Back in the real world. So in that case, it's going to be conditional proof three through seven. So it's going to be if first line, which was K, then last line, which is not M. Right? And then finally, well, obviously finally, so it'll be the conclusion, not K or not M, by implication line eight. Okay? All right, so this is a useful illustration uh, of something important about conditional proof. That doesn't have to be the last line of your proof. In other words, when you come back to the real world, it doesn't have to end there. What I mean is, conditional proof can be proved, can be used to prove any conditional. Now, normally, the conditional will be the conclusion. But in this case, there was no conditional as the conclusion. So what you did was you proved a conditional that you could convert into the conclusion. Maybe you will use a conditional proof to prove a conditional that will help you get the conclusion. You know, suppose one of your premises looked like this. Uh, I don't know, yeah, like this. <coughs> then if you proved if A then B, you could do disjunctive syllogism and get C. You know, imagine that's your conclusion. So you could use a conditional proof to get if A then B, even though it's not, part, it's not your conclusion, it's just something that will help you get your conclusion, C. Um, so, however, when you do that, when there are more lines of your proof after you've been in fantasy land, there are some rules you have to follow. You don't have to worry about it if your last line is just the, the line where you say conditional proof. That's fine. You won't get into any trouble. But if that's not the last line, if you're going to go on and do some more stuff here, remember this. You cannot, in any lines back in the real world, refer to lines in fantasy land. So in other words, suppose you were going on here and you're saying, oh, I need K. Oh, there it is. I'll use that K. Why can't you use that K? Because you're like fantasy land. So what? So now you're reaching a conclusion that's actually in the real world. That's right, because you don't in fact have K. That was just dreams. That was imagination. You don't really have K. So you can't use K to prove anything because you don't really have it. It was just a dream. All right, this is fantasy land. So you can't use, now of course you can use lines in the real world fr from, uh, you can in fantasy land refer to lines in the real world, as we have done here. We referred to line one in fantasy land. That's okay. So you can refer to, to places that are more real than where you are, but you cannot refer to places that are less real than where you are. So you can't refer to places that are to the right 
of where you are. You can only refer to places to the left. Okay? Yes? So how did you get if, if k then not n? Is that from the conditional proof? Is that saying like... Because we assumed, we assumed k. So we said, what if k was true? Okay. And then we showed that not m would follow. Okay. So if k is true, then not m is true okay. too. All right. So that's one rule. Don't refer to lines in fancy, which actually tells you, uh, it gives you some strategic advice. Because if there's something you can do before you assume, then do it before you assume. Because if you just immediately assume and then do something that you didn't need to assume for, well, you'll have done it in fantasy land and you can't refer to it later if you need it. So if you can do it without assuming, then do it. So if there's like a simplification that you want to get out of the way, do it before you start assuming. It'll just save you time later because it'll, uh, because if you do it here and then you'll want to refer, to refer to it later, well, you can't refer to it in there. You'll just have to do it again down here. So, basically, if there's stuff you can do before you start assuming, then do it. And then assume. Um, another couple of points about conditional proof. Look at uh, your homework again. Now, let's look at question two. For question two, Uh, obviously, you could do conditional proof to prove this. Now, it would look like this. You would say on line 4, you would assume P, and then you would try and get, say, on line 99. Uh, let's hope it doesn't take you that long. You would get if M then L, and then you go back to the real world and you prove if P then if M then L. By conditional proof 4 through 99. Boy, that was all the proof. Okay. That would be one way to do it. But notice that this is also a conditional. So here's a truth. There's, there's two ways you could do this. One thing is you could notice that what, does, what rule of equivalence does something that looks like that make you think of? Don't say association because association doesn't work with conditionals. Exportation. What is this equivalent to by exportation? P and M then L. So, in other words, what would be a, a good thing for me to assume to begin with? P and M. Now, you might think you're allowed to do that. You're allowed to assume, you know, a complicated thing. You're assuming. You can assume whatever you want, right? You can make up anything you want. So you assume P and M, then say on line 98, see this one was quicker, you get L, then you go back to the real world and you prove if P and M, then L by conditional proof 4 through 98, and then what's the last line of your proof? By doing exportation. Yeah, so you do exportation to that and you've got if P, then if M, then L. So that would be one way to do it. But there's also another way you can do it that is kind of more adventurous. And that's if you assume P, and then you can do stuff with P. So for example, you can do modus ponens 2, comma, uh, 4. So let's say you do that. And then you indent again. When I said that, it sounded like a Seinfeld episode where he says, then you dipped again. <laughs> if you don't know that episode, I pity you. All right, I'm going to assume again. What am I going to assi assume? M. M. That's right. So if this was, um, I don't know, Oz, this is now Narnia. You were, you were in Oz, and then you found... Uh, wardrobe, and you went through it, and now you're in Oz via Narnia. So you're two steps away from reality. You have to keep that straight. You have to come out of it step by step. So, I assume M again. Then, you know, I go on a few, and let's say it's just 35 this time. And I get L, somehow. Then I leave Narnia and go back to Oz. So I'm still in fantasy land, but I'm one stage more real than I was before. 
and I proved if M then L by what? Conditional proof what not line numbers? Six through thirty-five. And then I can go back to the real world entirely and say what? Conditional proof four through thirty-six. What have I proved? If first line, what's on line four? Then what's on line thirty-six? And that's the conclusion. Now if you do that. You are allowed to refer to lines in Narnia and the real world. Oh, no, this was Oz, wasn't it? You're allowed to refer to lines in Oz and the real world from Narnia. So because Oz is more real than Narnia, you can use lines from there. But you can't, in Narnia, refer to lines from Oz, because that's more fantasy. So again, you can refer to lines to the left of you, but you can't refer to lines from the right of you. All right? Keep your reality straight. Finally, one more trick. Actually, there's a couple more. Um, suppose I had to prove as my conclusion uh, A if and only if B. I had to prove a biconditional. I can use conditional proof to do that. How? Prove A then B then prove B then A. Yes, so let's say on line 4 I indent and I assume A and on line 20 I've got B. So I go back to the real world on line 21 I've got if A then B. By conditional proof for, for this assumption Four through twenty. Now what do I do, Josh? Uh, you do the same thing, but I go back into fantasy land and I assume B. And then what do I try and get? Yeah, I try and get A. And so I go back to the real world here on line forty one and I proved it B through then A by conditional proof twenty two through forty. Two stages, two steps left. What are my two steps? Not addition. Now, well, notice, I'm trying to get this. So on my last line, I'll approve this. What must I have used to get this? By conditional. On line 42. What is this equivalent to by by conditional? If A then B, and if B then A, how did I get how did I get that? By conjunction of lines 21 and 41. So in other words, I proved a biconditional by getting a conditional going in each direction, and I used a separate conditional proof to get each side. So I use one conditional proof to get a B then B, and another conditional proof to get a B then A. You cannot, in this fantasy land, refer to lines in this fantasy land. Because they're different. Here, you're assuming A. You're imagining that A is true. That's like imagining, say, imagine that we lost World War II. Imagine that the Allies lost World War II. This one, you're assuming B. That's a different fantasy land. That's like assuming, imagine that there are still dinosaurs. Okay, they're different, different alternate realities. So you cannot treat this one as if it's the same alternate reality in this one, so you cannot refer to lines in here. Okay? Oh, I've left it a bit late. Well, I'm going to introduce one more thing. Um, this is reductio ad absurdum. There is another method of uh, proof that involves assumption. And actually, it's a method of proof that you have used. It's called reductio ad absurdum. You throw that phrase around in your everyday life all the time, right? It's Latin. You all took Latin? What does Latin mean? Latin, what, Latin? what does that Latin phrase mean? Reductio ad absurdum. To reduce to absurdity. Yes to reduce to an absurdity. The good thing about Latin is it's like English with some vowels tacked on the end. 
uh, reduce to an absurdity. This is an argumentative technique which I guarantee you have used at some point. Because it works like this. Essentially, imagine, usually if you're arguing with a, a brother or sister or maybe your parents, and they say something that you disagree with, and you say this, oh yeah, well if that were true, then... And what you say is, if, if what you've said is just true, you're saying to them, then this crazy stupid thing would follow from that. Because you don't believe this crazy stupid thing, the thing you've just said must be wrong. Let me give you an example. Imagine, and this will probably take a lot of imagination for most of you, you're a vegetarian. Okay? Imagine you're a vegetarian. But you have a friend who has a habit of eating big juicy halo burgers in front of you, just to piss you off. Okay. Halo burger is particularly cruel. I mean, look at the symbol. You can even see the cow there. It's up in cow heaven saying, I'm glad you ate me. Um, but anyway, so this person is eating a halo burger in front of you, and um, you say, you get pissed off and then say, how can you do that? Cows are beautiful creatures. They're warm, loving, uh, think, thinking, breathing creatures. How can you eat them? And your friend responds this way, once he swallowed his mouthful of halo burger. He says, I have a moral principle that allows it. My moral principle is this. It's okay to eat anything dumber than you. That's my moral principle. Okay, now you reject this moral principle, and here's how you do it. You do it by reductio ad absurdum. So in other words, they've said something you disagree with, and you're going to disprove it. And the way you disprove it is by showing that it has, absurd, it has implications that they would reject. So you say, oh yeah? Well, if that was true, then you better avoid Stephen Hawking, because he can eat you. Okay? Who's Stephen Hawking? Yeah, like the smartest guy in the world. He's, he has to go around in a wheelchair. There's a movie about him. There's a new movie coming out about him, about his early days before motor neuron disease got him. I think it's called The Theory of Everything or something. I'm sure it'll be on all the multiplexes in Flint, if there are any left. Um, there's that one in Grand Blank, isn't there? Yeah, I don't think it's an IMAX movie. He did the Ace Bucket Challenge. What's that? He did the Ace Oh, yeah, yeah, I saw that. He nominated, like, the president of Oxford or Cambridge, I can't remember where. So, in other words, w the way this works is to say, look, if your principle is true, then it would follow that, you know, smart people can eat you. You don't believe that, so you must reject that principle. So you sh in other words, this is a method of disproving something by showing that it leads to an absurdity, hence reduced to an absurdity. Now, how does this apply to logic? Well, what you do is you assume something you want to disprove. So it's a method of disproving. You assume something you want to disprove, and then you show that that leads to something that <coughs> cannot be true. What kind of thing cannot be true in logic? <coughs> it's impossible for it to be true. A proposition and negation. Yes, a contradiction which looks like a proposition and the negation of that proposition. We've already seen that that can't be true, right? Because a conjunction, they both have to be true, but if, uh, if this is true, this would be false. So this is called a contradiction, and we know it must be false. But notice, every line that you write on a proof is supposed to be true. So if you arrive at something that looks like that, you know something weird has happened, because this can't be true. So what you do, the way you prove something, uh, no, it's a way of disproving something. You assume the thing you want to disprove, and you show that it leads to a contradiction. What contradiction? Answer any contradiction. That's what's great about reductio ad absurdum. It's much more open-ended. It allows, uh, it's, you're much less likely to get stuck. Last point before I let you go. What is it that you want to disprove? Remember, your job is to prove the conclusion. What is it you want to disprove then? The negation of the conclusion. Exactly. So what you assume is the negation of the conclusion. Because if you disproved the negation of the conclusion, you proved the conclusion. So, on your homework, if you were to use reductio ad absurdum on this one, what would you assume? Not you. Not you. It's not you, it's me. There you go. And you would try and get a contradiction. What contradiction? Could be anything. Could be P and not P, could be R and not R, could be T and not T. 
T could be R or T and not R or T. That's the beauty of reductio ad absurdum. I'm going to practice more of them next time. Like I said, if you can finish this homework by next class, great. If you haven't quite finished it, we will have time to work on it in class, but don't come to class with nothing. Because we won't have time for that. <laughs>